Our next cyanotic heart disease is total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So what does this mean? Pulmonary venous return is a blood that comes from the lung and goes to the left heart, specifically the left atrium, to supply oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. When it says it's anomalous, that means that the pulmonary venous return is not going to the right place. So instead of going to the left atrium, it instead connects with a systemic vein and goes to the right atrium. So what are the consequences of this? If oxygenated blood is going to the right side of the heart and the right side of the heart connects to the lung, then as a result, you'll never get oxygenated blood to the body. And this is what causes the severe problems of total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So as you can see here, we have the pulmonary veins, which should normally be going to the left atrium, but instead it's traveling to a systemic vein, merging with the blood there, and then going back to the right atrium, through the right ventricle, and back to the lungs. So you notice the blood never reaches the left side of the heart, and as a result, you can't get blood to the body. So this is a lethal condition unless there's additional defects. So there's two levels of severity. You have an obstructed pulmonary venous return, where it's infradiaphragmatic venous connection. So what does that mean? That means that the pulmonary venous return, instead of just going to the heart, it goes underneath the diaphragm, comes back up, and then goes to the systemic vein to connect to the left, right atrium. So if it's having this long connection and having a very long distance traveled, you have a much higher risk of obstruction. And that's why in these patients you get severe cyanosis, respiratory distress, pulmonary edema, and hypertension. The obstruction of the systemic vein because of the infradiaphragmatic connection will cause backup of blood leading to the pulmonary edema and hypertension because of the increased hydrostatic pressure. And you also get cyanosis because less blood is able to make it to systemic circulation and respiratory distress because of the pulmonary edema and hypertension. If it's not obstructed and it just goes to the systemic vein and comes back and mixes with the other sides, it will be a non-obstructed pulmonary venous return and will have very mild cyanosis with some shortness of breath. So is survival possible without an additional defect? We just talked about this. Without the additional defect, there will be never any connection between the two systems, and the left side of the heart cannot plump, pump oxygenated blood to the body. So as a result, in both obstructive and non-obstructive PVR, you have to have some kind of connection either through a PDA or through a atrial septal defect or patent foramen ovale in order to have survival be possible to get blood to the systemic circulation. So blood flow depends on right to left shunting through an ASD or VSD because remember all the blood is going through the pulmonary vein, going to the systemic vein and coming back to the right atrium. The only way for it to reach the other side of the heart is through a defect such as the right atrium to left atrium septal defect or through a defect between the pulmonary artery and the aorta called the patent ductus arteriosus which allows mixing of blood and that'll cause some hypooxygenated blood to reach circulation, which is way better than the alternative where no blood at all reaches it. Now let's talk about some signs and symptoms associated with total anomalous pulmonary venous return. As we mentioned, when you get the obstructed pulmonary venous return, you're having blockage of the pulmonary vein flow, and this is going to cause backup of blood into the lungs and the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary capillaries. So as a result of this backup of blood, and backup of fluid, you get respiratory distress, pulmonary edema, and cyanosis. So the distress and edema makes sense because you're backing up blood, but why do you get the cyanosis? The cyanosis is because this pulmonary venous return is necessary to provide oxygenated blood back to the right heart to go to the left heart. So if you block it, you have even less oxygen returning to the right side of the heart to go to the left side of the heart to go to circulation. So cyanosis is a very common associated factor. Physical exam shows a parasternal lift and a single S2 second heart sound. So why is there a parasternal lift? Remember, the right side of the heart is getting most of, this, uh, most of the circulation, most of the preload, and as a result, you get right ventricular hypertrophy, and that's gonna push, open, push forward the sternum and cause this parasternal lift. You also get a single loud second heart sound because remember, once again, the right side of the heart is having more pressure and more blood, and that's gonna cause a louder sound on the right side versus the left side. The left side is not getting as much blood flow because it requires a left to right sh a right to left shunt in order to get any blood at all. Unobstructed pulmonary venous return. When you have unobstructed pulmonary venous return, you've got adequate blood flow back to the, the right heart from the lungs, and that blood flow can go across to the left side without too many issues and without too much obstruction of the venous return. So you get only very mild heart failure symptoms because the heart isn't really losing that much preload. When you're obstructed, preload is massively decreased. Unobstructed, the preload comes back, 
and has to cross over the atrial septal defect or PDA to supply systemic circulation. You also have a widely split with the loud pulmonary component S2. So what does this mean, widely split with loud pulmonary component? Remember, we also we already, we already talked about how you had excessive blood flow on the right side. So when you breathe in, you get more blood flow on the right side of the heart. Remember, with inspiration, you get a split S2 because there's a decreased intrathoracic pressure causing more blood to flow into the lungs and more blood to flow into the right heart. And it'll cause delay of the P2 heart sound. So if you have excessive blood in the right side of the heart, you'll get a widely split S2 with a loud pulmonary component because of more blood flow on the right side. You also get a systolic ejection murmur along the left sternal border. This is caused by a flow murmur because of too much blood going across the pulmonary, pulmonic valve. And that'll cause a systolic ejection murmur. And in this condition, you get increased pulmonary vascularity because you get a lot of preload coming back to the heart and a lot of blood returning to the lungs through the pulmonic valve, causing a hyperdynamic percordium. What does a hyperdynamic dynamic percordium mean? It means that the, the below the chest is moving a lot. The percordium is the area right below the sternum and below the chest wall. And it's going to be hyperdynamic because there's going to be so much blood on the right side and in the pulmonary vasculature, it's going to cause the percordium to look like it's moving a lot. So this is a classic thing you'll see in a lot of different conditions. Diagnosis. How are we going to diagnose this condition? Remember, like always, the best test is echocardiography, but it's not the first test that you're going to do. Chest X-ray and EKG are the first test. And what you're going to see in the obstructive form is diffuse pulmonary edema because of massive backup of blood. Unobstructed, you'll get a very enlarged heart. Remember, the preload is fine. So you get lots of blood going to the right side of the heart, and you get increased pulmonary vascular markings not because of obstruction and backup, but because of increased blood flow through the lung. EKG, because the right side is affected more and much bigger than the left side, you'll get right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy. Now the treatment for this condition. So because we talked about the heart failure symptoms and the diffuse pulmonary edema, this must be treated before surgery. You don't want to put a crashing patient into surgery until you, def until you manage their symptoms and get rid of the excess fluid in any way possible medically. Then you can do surgery to save the patients. Now let's talk about a sample question regarding diagnosis. So, like always, we start with what is the most likely diagnosis? And we can take a little break here from the learning and try to apply it with some sample questions. A, transposition of the great arteries. B, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. C, tricuspid atresia. D, truncus arteriosus. And E, tetralogy of Fallot. So we have some kind of cyanotic heart disease going on here, and we need to defi define which one it is by looking at the case vignette. So let's take a look. 48-hour-old female infant develops progressive cyanosis that worsens with feeding. She was born at term to a mother, so she's born at term. All of her prenatal appointments were attended. Okay, good mom there. Since include rapid breathing, dusky complexion, and fatigue. Vital signs are afebrile, heart rate of 160, Respiratory rate of 56, BP of 86 over 50, and pulse ox of 82. Remember, on the previous slides, we talked about normal um, heart rates, blood pressures, and respiratory rates in a, a female infant that's new, or male or female newborn infant. So the heart rate is within normal limits. The respiratory rate is actually very high. Pulse ox is very low, and blood pressure is borderline high. So the main thing we want to be concerned about is respiratory rate and the rapid breathing. Auscultation demonstrates a harsh systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur at the left upper sternal border and a prominent parasternal heave. So a harsh, holosyst a harsh systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur, what does that make you think of? Right, pulmonic stenosis. This isn't going to be a, a flow murmur because it's crescendo-decrescendo. That means there's some kind of stenosis present. And a prominent parasternal heave means that the right side of the heart is very enlarged because the right side of the heart is what's found beneath the sternum. So proscaline E1 infusion is provided to keep the ductus arteriosus open and symptoms improve. So the PDA is kept open and symptoms improve. That's an important thing to note. But cyanosis is still present. So um, venous blood is still reaching the left side of systemic circulation. EKG shows right axis deviation and right ventricular hypertrophy. So right side of the heart is enlarged again and decreased pulmonary vascular markings. So let's go from here. So the main thing that you want to always take a look at is a decrease versus increased pulmonary vascular markings. That can tell you a lot, okay? So when you have hypoplastic left heart syndrome and truncus arteriosus, are you going to have decreased or increased pulmonary vascular markings? 
you're going to have increased pulmonary vascular markings. In hypoplastic left heart, the left heart is damaged. The left ventricle is hypoplastic. And as a result, a lot more blood goes on the right side and into the lungs. So it can be hypoplastic left heart, and that's not associated with a crescendo-decrescendo pulmonic stenosis murmur. Truncus arteriosus. That would cause increased pulmonary vascular markings as well because there's a common flow pathway between the heart and the lungs and the aorta as well. So remember, in truncus arteriosus, the pulmonary artery and aorta never divided and they're still combined together. So lots of blood is going both to the aorta and to the pulmonary artery. And remember, blood flows down the low resistance pathway. And what's lower resistance, the aorta or pulmonary artery? Pulmonary artery, so you get increased pulmonary vascular markings. Okay, now let's talk about um, tricuspid atresia, okay? In tricuspid atresia, what is more affected, the right side of the heart or the left side of the heart? Right, the right side of the heart. So you'd actually have left side enlargement instead of right side enlargement in tricuspid atresia, so that can't be right either. Now between transposition of the great arteries and tetralogy of Fallot. Is transposition of the great arteries associated with a harsh systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur? No, it's not. Remember, in the transition of the great arteries, you've got the arteries on the wrong side. So you've got the pulmonary artery coming off the left side, and you've got the aorta coming off the right side. So you'll get a loud, single second heart sound because of the excessive blood flow and the higher pressures in the right side of the heart where the aorta is reaching systemic circulation. You're not going to get this uh, harsh crescendo decrescendo murmur because it's more of a flow murmur instead of a stenosis. So we can get rid of transition of the great arteries as well. All right. So the only answer left is tetralogy of Fallot. And let's talk about why that's the answer. Decreased pulmonary vascular markings. Remember, one of the tetralogy is pulmonic stenosis, pulmonary artery stenosis. That fits this and this. You have a prominent peristernal heave. That fits with the right ventricular hypertrophy. And prostaglandin E1 infusion helps. Remember, <clears throat> prostaglandin E1 infusions will provide an opening of the PDA to connect the aorta to the pulmonary artery. So in Tetralogy of Fallot, there's very little blood flowing through the pulmonary artery. So giving PGE1 to open up the ductus arteriosus will allow for blood flow from the left side to the right to allow more blood to go into the lungs and be oxygenated.